What does a new phase in Israel's war on Gaza entail? Its army is pulling some troops from the Strip. It says it's adopting more targeted operations against Hamas. Can Israel still achieve its objectives in the war? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Elizabeth Puranam. Israel's longest war is entering a new phase. Nearly three months in, Israel's military is pulling some of its forces out of Gaza. But Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the fight against Hamas will continue for many more months. The new strategy, it seems, will focus on carrying out more targeted attacks against the armed group. But with more than 20,000 Palestinians killed and millions displaced, some are questioning whether Israel can achieve its military goals. Political divisions inside and outside Israel are fueling criticism of Netanyahu's handling of the war and quite possibly shaping his decisions on how to approach it. So what does this new military phase mean for Israel, the Palestinians and for Hamas fighters? We'll explore those issues with our guests in a moment. But first, this report by Katia lopez Horeyan. It's a new stage in the war on Gaza. Some Israeli soldiers are being withdrawn from the Strip, and some analysts see it as an attempt to shift the military's focus to more targeted attacks against Hamas. A way to redirect attention to Lebanon, where Hezbollah fighters have been exchanging fire with Israeli forces to show solidarity with Palestinians. We continue intensive strikes to hit Hezbollah's deployment close to the northern border. It no longer looks as it did on October 6, nor will it. The move comes amid widening political divisions in Israel's coalition government over how to manage the war and how to end it. Under pressure from his ultra-right coalition partners, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu cancelled a war cabinet meeting last week where post-war arrangements were due to be discussed. Despite Israel's removal of some battalions from the Strip, he says strikes on Gaza will continue. We've had great success in the war and also some painful cases. Achieving victory will require time. As the Israeli army chief says, the war will continue for many more months. Netanyahu is facing criticism on several fronts. Israel's biggest ally, Washington, is pushing Israel to scale back its indiscriminate attacks on Gaza. At home, protesters are still calling on Netanyahu to secure the release of Israeli hostages. Analysts and others say Netanyahu's credibility is at risk and political pressures are likely driving his decisions. I'm afraid that the government of Israel has prioritized other, uh, uh, otherwise its, uh, its political uh, uh, ambitions and the hostages is not on the top priorities. In order to release these hostages, a ceasefire must be taking place. There is no other way. In what could signal another significant shift, the U.S. Defense Secretary has announced the withdrawal of aircraft carrier Gerald Ford from Israel's shores. The threat of spillover conflict, he says, has declined. The war on Gaza is Israel's longest war. In nearly three months, more than 20,000 Palestinians have been killed and more than 2 million displaced. And now, as Israel looks to a new phase, many are questioning what is being achieved, both in the short and long term. Katia lopez Odoyan, Al Jazeera, for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests. In London is Andreas Krieg, Associate Professor of Security Studies at King's College London and an expert on security and strategy in the Middle East. In Haifa is Diana Butu, Palestinian lawyer and former legal advisor to the Palestine Liberation Organization. And also in London is Yossi Meckelberg, Professor of International Relations and Associate Fellow of the MENA program, program Chatham House. A very warm welcome to all of you. Mr. Krieg, I'll begin with you in London. There has been a lot of talk for weeks now about a new phase of the war, most notably with the U.S., 
urging Israel to conduct its operations differently. What do you think this new phase will look like? Yes, I mean, the Israelis have been under a lot of pressure over the last couple of weeks by the Americans in particular to kind of tone down the intensity of war fighting. And for the last two, three weeks, we were talking about a next phase coming soon. And I think we're entering that new phase now. Um, the Americans really wanted to see an end of fighting and kind of hoping that there would be a more permanent ceasefire in the making. Unfortunately, the Israelis are saying they haven't achieved any of their objectives yet, particularly when it comes to freeing hostages and, and also killing uh, the most senior members of Hamas. So the next stage is probably going to be a more low intensity uh, counterinsurgency phase where we see operations being conducted by kind of spearheaded uh, sort of special forces and uh, and other pioneering forces who, are, who will remain within the Gaza Strip in what we see on satellite images to appear to be uh, fortified forward operating bases and from from which they could now operate deeper into the territory. But we'll see some of the uh, kind of rear end of IDF forces who were there not to seize territory but to hold territory to kind of be uh, uh, kind of in, in incrementally being removed from the Gaza Strip. Uh, and then we'll see also more targeted operations to kind of respond to emerging targets when they come with probably close air support from the air and, and then allowing probably hopefully Palestinians to return to whatever is left of their houses and which is obviously not a lot and allowing for more humanitarian aid to come in but the Israelis are building this at the moment they really haven't laid it out yet we're seeing we might have a, a press conference later today where this mm -hmm. will be outlined in more depth all right, Ms. Butu in Haifa, do you think that the next phase, how hopeful are you that a next phase of Israel's operation could be, if not the beginning of the end of this war, certainly a move to what Mr. Krieg describes as uh, lower intensity? Look, I, I disagree. I think from the beginning, Israel has made clear what it wants to do with the Gaza Strip. This is not at all about returning Israelis. It's all about ethnically cleansing the Gaza Strip and perpetrating a genocide. They've made it clear from day one when they said that they wanted to see a smaller Gaza and a thinned out population. Can you imagine if we had, if you'd heard people around the world talking about thinning out the Jewish population and, and for nearly 90 days seeing bomb after bomb after bomb, you'd see global outrage. But what they do instead is they're couching this in terms of some sort of military phases when we know that that's not at all the case. If they wanted the Israelis returned, they could have returned them within the first few days when the offer was on the table. But instead, Israel's taking the opportunity to ethnically cleanse the Gaza Strip and to perpetrate a genocide. And I don't think that we should be shy about saying what it is that Israel's doing. And I also disagree with the fact that these claims that somehow the United States is asking Israel to ease up. They've had opportunity after opportunity to actually vote in favor of resolutions, UN Security Council resolutions, demanding that Israel stop. And instead, they've either vetoed or they've abstained. And so they're not doing anything to put any pressure whatsoever on Israel. This could all be ended if the United States picked up the phone and said to Israel, enough is enough, or if the world said to Israel, enough is enough. But all that I see is that this, there's a genocide being perpetrated and people are talking about phases of, of a military operation. It's, it's quite silly. Mr. Meckelberg, what do you think of what you've heard so far and how genuine Israel is, or even the US is, when they talk about uh, doing more to protect civilian casualties going forward, more targeted operations against the leadership of Hamas, rather than the wide-scale bombing that we've seen so far? Yeah, I think it's difficult to really decipher what's, what's the intention here, because we hear so many contradictory messages from Israel, from the United States, from the international community. So if you believe for the far right in Israel says, so probably talking about reducing the, the, the population of, of, of Gaza and completely unacceptable against international uh, law. Uh, people like uh, Bezalel Smotrich talking about the only way for security is if the only 100,000 to 200,000 uh, people uh, live, uh, Palestinians stay in Gaza. I don't think this is the, 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 the direction uh, forward. I think there is the re rhetoric that uh, some of the far right try to push resettling Gaza and, and reducing the population. At the end of the day, the, the, the people of Gaza, the Palestinians, they're not going anywhere. And I don't think there is going to be a situation they are pushed uh, elsewhere. 
I think what we are going into, to what Anya said earlier, into a low intensity, intensity war. Obviously, many of us called for a ceasefire long, long, long time ago mm -hmm. because the level of, 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 of killing through bombardment by Israeli bombardment is completely uh, un, un, unacceptable. So we need to move to, into, into a ceasefire. What the Israeli claim is the, the move to phase three of, of, of this war. As, as a result of the, the discharge, many of the reservists, let's, uh, let's remind our listeners or the viewers that you know, there is impact when you, an, an army is based on reservists. It means there is also economic impact to this. Yeah, and instance, one of the reasons, Mr. Meckelberg, one of the reasons that uh, Israeli officials have said that they are pulling so many troops out of Gaza is to return the reservists to civilian life, to shore up the, you know, war-battered economy, is, Ms. Butu, let correct. me come to you here. Just how much of a consideration would you say the Israeli economy is to the war cabinet and its decision-making? Look, I think that what Netanyahu really cares about is Netanyahu, and he wants to stay in power. And unfortunately, the longer this war continues, the longer it is that he is able to stay in power. And this is exactly what the calculation is. At the same time, the Israelis are quite worried about the body bags that are coming back uh, into Israel from the Gaza Strip. This is quite a high number for the Israelis, and I don't think that they expected this level of resistance back. Plus, of course, there is a battered economy. But I think first and foremost, this is all about Netanyahu wanting to stay in power and doing everything possible to prolong this war, which is why I, I very much disagree that this isn't about ethnic cleansing. It is. He's made it clear. He's now pushing other countries to take in uh, people to take in people from Gaza. They, he's destroyed the infrastructure completely. He's destroyed the largest Palestinian city. Um, which is Gaza City. And it's all because he doesn't want Palestinians to be able to return back to the Gaza Strip and he wants to stay in power. Mr. Meckelberg, the latest poll by the Israel Democracy Institute shows that only 15% of Israelis want Netanyahu to remain prime minister. Do you agree with Ms. Bhutto? Do you think that he has a personal interest in not discussing the future? We heard that a war cabinet meeting was cancelled last week uh, amid reports that Netanyahu doesn't want to discuss what happens after the war. Well, I, in this, I, I completely agree with that. And I think, unfortunately, Israel being hijacked, taken hostage by, by Netanyahu's personal interest because of his corruption at trial, he needs to stay to stay in power to also potentially not go to jail and not to ne to his corruption trial never uh, coming to its its natural conclusion. So in this sense, we I think this is this is the case, and he has interest even in, in prolonging the war as long as as he assumes that there is a correlation for between prolonging the war and him staying in in power. But mm -hmm. yes, his, his, his level of, of support within the Israeli society is very low. What Israel needs is actually a fresh election. But this, even this is not going to ensure the, the, the end of the war mm -hmm. and whether there is an Israeli plan for the future of Gaza. The one thing, whatever the plans of the far right, I think the international community won't allow to push 2.3 million Palestinians out of Gaza if and if the United yeah. States is serious okay. about it, it's it's about what it's about two state solution and a ceasefire, it needs to act and act quickly. And yet, the international community has allowed more than nearly 22 Palestinian, uh, 22,000 Palestinian people to have been killed, uh, two thirds of them women and children. Mr. Craig, let me bring you in to talk about what has been achieved in this nearly three months of unprecedented attacks on the Gaza Strip before, you know, any new phase. Israel has always stated that its objectives are destroying Hamas and bringing back the captives. How m do you think it's achieved any part of those objectives? No, not really. And I think from the from the onset when these these objectives were stated, it became clear for most analysts, military analysts and strategic analysts in particular, to say this strategy is not achievable, is not sustainable. And the worst part of this, all this slaughter, all that killing, all that destruction that we've seen across the Gaza Strip has come very much in vain because what has been achieved is very little. And what the Israelis are now realizing, and they should have realized, they should have known, intelligence should have known, 
after the 7th of October is that there is a city beneath the city. So they have leveled and flattened the entire part of the urban area overground of Gaza City, but now haven't really moved forward in, into the underground world. And they're now saying there are hospitals, there are tunnels, there are, you know, we knew that there was a city beneath the city. And that fight, which was always going to be the more difficult one, is the one that you can't target from the air, is the one where you need to send infantry in. This tunnel system is still intact, largely intact. The fact that they haven't really decapitated Hamas, which is what they wanted to achieve, they haven't found the leaders that they were looking for, also suggests that they haven't made much progress on that front, we still see on the New Year's, uh, New Year's Eve, we saw rockets being fired into, into central Israel from the Gaza Strip, despite the fact that most of the territory has actually been occupied now by the IDF. Um, they haven't released the hostages. Again, that is the only way you can release the hostages through negotiation. Uh, Hamas has put a lot of different proposals on the table that uh, Bibi Netanyahu has refused to accept. Um, and Hamas remains oper operational. And my point being, and it remains the same over the last two months, is if you want to fight an idea like Hamas, Hamas, if you want to fight resistance, if mm -hmm. this is what you're trying to demobilize, then what you need to do is you need to offer a social and a political alternative. Israel has offered absolutely nothing, nothing yeah. in terms of a strategy, nothing in terms of an end, nothing to an alternative to the Palestinian people that they can embrace. And Ms. Krieg, when Andreas, uh, Ms. Butu rather, when Andreas Krieg speaks about the absolutely limited achievements of the Israeli military against Hamas, against its expansive tunnel network militarily. What kind of impact has this war had on Hamas as a political movement? I think that it's, it's uh, I think we should be step back and really question this idea that a city can be a target. A city can't be a target. And, and what we're hearing, what I heard, is that, you know, it's okay in many ways to, to simply wipe out cities because they haven't yet achieved their targets. I know that's not exactly what he was saying, but if you read between the lines, this is what many of the analysts have been saying. And I think that it's very important that we step back from that and really question this idea that Israel gets to achieve carte blanche, uh, that it could do whatever it wants and, and carry out whatever it wants to carry out because there's something called Hamas. That that said, if you ask me about where Hamas is standing, um, the, I can tell you that people are very much supportive of the, of anybody who's going to stand in the in the way between them and their annihilation. And right now, it's Israel that's doing the annihilating, and it's Hamas that is trying to protect Palestinians from being wiped off the map. And so, you have seen a rise in support for Hamas because we haven't seen that anybody on, uh, around the world is coming to the defense of Palestinians or trying to protect Palestinians. Palestinians. Quite to the contrary, people are tar tar talking about how it's okay to target schools, how it's okay to target hospitals, how it's okay to target a tunnel infrastructure. When that's not at all, uh, but we have legitimate. seen, Ms. Buto, we've seen at the certainly at the United Nations within the General Assembly, within the Security Council, the majority of people want to protect Palestinian civilians and are saying that Israel's operation is not okay. It's the U.S. that has been blocking resolutions calling for a ceasefire. Correct. But they, we also have not seen a mass mobilization of international countries, particularly from the West, who've actually put into place measures to stop Israel. All that we've seen is one leader after another come forward and give Israel the greenest of green lights. And that is why the United States feels so emboldened to continue to do so. This is, this is an issue of genocide, and it's up to the world to stop genocide. This is what the international legal system was developed for, was to precisely stop genocide. And right now, the only country that I've seen step forward and try to push for an end to this is South Africa through their yeah. filing of the case before the International Court of Justice. And Israel has said that it will respond to that case, that it is going to um, contest this case brought by South Africa. As a lawyer, how do you assess the case of genocide against Israel? And do you think that cases such as this impact what it does on the battlefield, even allegations? Yes. So in terms of whether a, a claim can be made, yes, very easily. Look, there's two components to genocide. One is the actions, which we've seen being carried out, and I've already described those, and, and my co-panelists co have also described them. But there's also the intent. And the intent is usually the most difficult part to achieve. And yet here we've seen that Israeli leader after Israeli leader, whether that includes the Minister of Defense, the President himself, or the Prime Minister, have made statements that are genocidal. And it's the genocidal statements 
coupled with the actions that we've seen on the ground that can easily make the case of genocide. And this is where the international legal system has been brought into place. The whole system was designed as a system to prevent the, the grossest of gross um, uh, atrocities. And genocide is the most gross of the atrocities that can be perpetrated. This is why I say that it's up to the world community to put into place action mm -hmm. to stop Israel. Will it affect people on the ground? I certainly hope so. And if it doesn't, this is why we also see that people are putting forward claims against the individual uh, officers themselves, the individual people who've made these orders themselves, so that they too can be brought before the International All Criminal right. Court. Mr. Meckelberg, you've heard what Andreas Krieg, what Diana Butu have said, that the nearly three months of Israel's attacks on Gaza, they haven't uh, deterred Hamas militarily, they haven't um, defeated them politically. What are the conversations that the Israeli war cabinet is having at the moment about what they're going to do next? Is the Israeli war cabinet united in their approach? Well, I think there are differences in cabinet, no doubt about it. I think the important point here, while Israel has the right to retaliate after what happens in, in October 7, this is not the right way to respond to this. And, and the killing of, of more than 20,000 uh, people in, in, in Gaza, most of them civilians, the destruction, the devastation caused in Gaza. And I think once and for all, there must be a recognition. There is no military solution for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There is, only, there is only political one. And now you have in cabinet the views that see the war should continue for another year, even, even two more low intensity war. And, and, and what they said that they will find the leadership of, of, of Hamas reducing its military uh, capability. What the war at the end of the day is doing is pushing more and more people into the ends of, of, of the radicals because mm -hmm. it doesn't say it doesn't say it also hope for Palestinian people. It doesn't set the plan that will end in a peaceful solution. It can be different modalities, but at the end of the day, it's only the political solution. And in the current Israeli cabinet, there is not a single person there that is believing in a political solution. They just look at it through military, uh, through military prism, and this is not going to But work. even within that military prism, does Prime Minister Netanyahu and Defence Minister Gallant, are they on, their, on the same page about what the next phase of the war looks like militarily? Well, there, there are differences, and some of them actually want to move the war to the north now and, 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 and moving from Gaza and having a full-blown war with, with Hezbollah in the north because uh, this, is, this is a priority. Because Israel was caught by surprise, because Israel is in a, in a, in a political turmoil, and as we saw it from the decision by the, the Supreme Court only, only uh, yesterday, they look for all sorts of solutions that different people have different interests. Netanyahu is interested to stay in power, as we mentioned earlier, because of his corruption trial. Uh, Gallant looks through, through, again, military prison, and he believes that, that Hamas can be destroyed, not uh, understanding mm -hmm. that Hamas is also a political and ideological movement. So hence, you, you can need to deal with it by, by offering an alternative. And then you have, of course, the extreme far right that, that look into, into, into expelling Palestinians, by the way, not only in yeah. Gaza, but also the annexation of the West Bank and expelling probably Palestinians there too. So yes, you, you have a divided cabinet with different views, but mm -hmm. not a strategy. And Mr. Cree, Mr. Meckelberg touched on what's happening on Israel's northern, northern border with Lebanon, and Israeli officials have also said that one of the reasons for pulling out the troops from Gaza is to free up uh, soldiers for what could happen on the northern border. Do you think they are preparing for an escalation against Hezbollah in the north? No, I, I think it would be extremely stupid of Israel. I mean, they've made a lot of strategic uh, mistakes and obviously a lot of uh, miscalculations over the last couple of months. Uh, but this would be a strategic miscalculation that I would think would bring Israel to the ver verge of a military collapse. Uh, the fact that the Americans are pulling some of their troops out as well suggests that they don't think that this escalation is on the books. Mm -hmm. um, Israel is already very much bogged down on what's going on in Gaza. They can't afford another front. And a front with Hezbollah is going to be much worse than anything we've seen uh, from Hamas. The rockets that could be fired from southern Lebanon across the territory of Israel with much bigger warheads would destroy Israel. Um, and it would be uh, something that the the, the, the population in Israel would not be willing to sustain. 
And Ms. Butu, I could see you smiling earlier when Andreas Krieg began to say that he doesn't think Israel is preparing for an escalation in the north. What do you think? I think you know, I was smiling because he said that Israel has made some very strategic errors. And I would say, yes, they have. I very much agree. They've made a number of strategic errors. But but I think it's also um, th what Israel is doing. The errors that they've made are strategic, not in the way that many people are thinking of it, but in a, in a totally different way. I think that the way that Israel has laid out this war in, in these number of phases is really just a, a ruse. And it's just trying to distract people from what it's what it is intentionally trying to do, which is to carry out ethnic cleansing of the Gaza Strip and carry out genocide. But the strategic error, I think, is the fact that they have gone into the Gaza Strip and somehow expected that there wasn't going to be any resistance. There is. And they will. Uh, they may also foolishly try to go into Lebanon and somehow expect that there isn't going to be resistance. There will be. Um, any place where, where Israel believes that it can somehow uh, go in and steal more land, it will always be met with resistance, and Israel yeah. knows that. And Ms. Puto, you've our former advisor to the Palestine Liberation Organization, you've taken part in very high level negotiations before. What would you be advising Palestinian political factions now? Look, I think if we have to be aware of where we are in this today. And it's very difficult to talk about tomorrow without being able to actually see what the Gaza Strip is going to look like and what it looks like today. I haven't been able to get in and, and millions of other Palestinians have not been able to get into the Gaza Strip either. So it's impossible to talk about future steps without knowing what Gaza looks like today. That said, I think that we do have to be very well aware that that uh, Palestinians need to be the ones who decide their future. We can't. We can no longer live in a system where it's Israel who gets to decide, Israel gets to determine, the international community gets to determine. We're now in the year 2024, and, and Palestinians deserve the, their freedom, and we have a right to self-determination. If anything, we must continue to insist that any anything that happens in the West Bank that is Palest or and in Gaza Strip, it's Palestinians who decide, not Israelis who decide, and that we finally, finally, finally be given our freedom. Thank you to all of our guests. That is Andreas Krieg in London, Diana Butu in Haifa, and Yossi Meckelberg also in London. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Elizabeth Puranam, and the whole team here, bye for now.